Luke 16, verses 1 to 15. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal, into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with very much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisee who loved money heard all this and was sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Anthony. Father God, we just thank you for Anthony. We thank you for the gifts that you've given him. We thank you for the time that he's prepared, the word he's going to share with us. And we just ask now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will help us to hear what you are saying as he unpacks this passage to us. We just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as um, Ian gets the sound levels right for us today, um, I want to add my own testimony in uh, what happened in Holiday Club this year. I, I had um, a great opportunity given to me to have the ultimate power that anyone can be given in any church situation, which is the volume control on the PA. <laughs> and on the, I think it was the, fr I don't know whether it was the Thursday or the Friday, I was up there, and the children were singing Waymaker. I pushed as they got louder, and I pushed as they got louder, and the PA could not outplay the sound of these children shouting their voices. That is who you are. And I literally had tingles, and I was in tears as these children proclaimed the glories of God. If we will not speak out, the stones will sing. And the children sang. Praise God.
before I, I preach, just want to um, pray those words from Psalm 19. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, God and Saviour. Amen. Well, some of you may be visitors here, um, a bit like me, <laughs> and... Um, my name is Anthony. I am one of the, the leadership team here. And uh, it's great to have this opportunity in the summertime when we don't have, we have a suspension of the normal pattern of preaching. And so we've had people from care at the start of the month. We've had the holiday club service. You had Malcolm last week. Yeah, yeah with the... Um, the parable of the talents, and here we have this quite ambiguous passage today. Uh, as a spoiler, we will be looking at the parable of Lazarus and the rich man in another week. But I often wonder whether this, this parable is actually misnamed, and we will go through that as we, as we go on. And I have to admit, this is a passage that I have wanted to explore now for quite a long time. Uh, several years ago, I went through the Crucible um, Bible course teaching, which was held in Exeter. And we had this particular passage, this Luke 16 passage, explained to us from a very different perspective. And it really brought it to life for me. And... I really hoped that when I had opportunity to, to preach it, because you don't get into a passage either unless you're writing a, uh, an essay on it or you're writing a sermon on it. You don't have the, the time to really spend weeks looking at a passage. But I'd got it into my head that this passage, I wanted to share with you that joy that I had uh, received from that time in crucible and as I've said it is a really ambiguous passage uh, one that very few theologians actually agree on so if you by the end of this come to a different viewpoint great I've had to wrestle with at least four uh, and come out with on on one side but if God reveals something else to you that is actually the power of scripture so don't be afraid if you have something else that comes out of it. But I do find that scripture has this uncanny quality. That just when you think you have done all of your homework, just when you think you've really understood something, just when you think you've got all the points really neatly arranged, it just comes and slaps you and says, have another look. And this is exactly what happened to me with this passage. The reason it stands as an ambiguous passage is the way it seems to commend or praise some shrewd or underhand behaviour. Practice that seems less than wholesome. Not quite in line with what we normally see from Jesus. But Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever and if we think he's changed his tune as we read a passage like this actually we need to go back and look at it again to rehear what Jesus says and I confess I found passages like this one actually to be some of the most useful passages because it's so easy to come to a piece of scripture and it makes absolutely perfect sense to you. But when you leave the church, you take no challenge with you. We can learn something. And then that final takeaway message just gets lost as you exit the building. But passages like this one, that aren't clear cut. Passages that will get under your skin if you give them the opportunity to. Passages like this act more like a mirror to your soul. And they pose questions like, 
Where am I in this story? Or where is God or Jesus in this story? Because he is always in there somewhere. What does a passage like this have to say to a world and a life that is full of nuance and complexity? And rather than come up with a list of activities that we can tick off and say, well, haven't I been a good Christian then? Actually, we're challenged with very different questions. And it's much less, what do I need to do? Or what information do I need to learn? As, who is God asking me to become? And in this story, lots of this stuff gets all mixed up. It's ambiguous, it's subversive. There is treachery and jealousy, there is slander, there is miscarriage of justice, there is insider trading, there is fraud, there is asset mismanagement. And through the words of the rich man, these actions seem to be admired and praised. And it's difficult when you see these actions at face value, it's difficult to see how Jesus could approve of these behaviours? Or is there something else going on here? So let's set the scene a bit. This parable, this story sits between a couple of other really significant parables. And certainly it complements the the parable of the talents that Malcolm uh, spoke to you about last week. But it actually goes a step further. In Luke 15, which is the parable that precedes where we are today, we get the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. And the parable begins with a certain man. The parable afterwards, uh, chapter 16, verse 19, is there was a certain rich man. And here in chapter 16, verse 1, again we have this linking statement. There was a certain rich man. So already, Luke is linking these passages together. And actually, the three passages together form what Luke is trying to convey through his theology. The parable of the lost son in chapter 15, the father had every right to be angry with the son. We know he he virtually called him dead and went off and spent his money. And the father's response in that parable was shockingly unexpected. And the story ends there with a twist. And certainly as you read through Luke's gospel, you sense his theological focus. Luke, the the physician, is a people person. And often you will pick up through the stories that he brings, the real heart for social justice, for economic justice. And his stories have a twist. And certainly the theological academics that explore Luke through the eyes of the poor in our society, have added greatly to understanding what Luke is all about. And that's where, actually, that's the sermon I was going to give you. But then Jesus, then the scripture slaps me around the face and says, look again. And as we begin this story, Jesus is addressing the disciples. But they weren't the only ones listening. If you read from verses 14 and 15, we also understand the Pharisees were listening. And they were getting irate. In the previous story, in the parable of the the prodigal son and the forgiving father, the finger of blame had pointed very, very strongly at them, at the angry, unforgiving older son. And as Jesus tells this story, 
somehow Jesus is developing another twist. And once again, that finger of blame seems to be pointing back at them again. And they start getting angry with Jesus, lashing out at him. I have to ask, why is that? So let's get into this text. There was a certain rich man. And he has working for him a manager, a steward. Probably one of many who would have managed his portfolio of assets. And you would have got that from the parable of the talents last week. Because there were how many? Hint? Three. Three. Excellent. And somewhere along the line, an accusation is made to this manager, this steward, that somehow this steward is wasting the owner's assets. Actually, the word that is used in the Greek uh, is one to sow, to, to spread. We might say to invest. And it's only used twice in the New Testament here, and actually in chapter 15, where actually the, the prodigal son is accused of squandering. It's the same word uh, for squandering that the accusation is made of here. So this accusation, it's from an unspecified, now former set of colleagues, former disgruntled colleagues. And basically they're saying, we don't like how you're spending the boss's money. But I have to say, if the manager himself had been losing money, do you think he would have waited for someone to come along and say they're wasting your money? No, it, it, he'd have worked that out already. So this accusation is hostile. And actually that's where the Greek tells us that this is highly hostile. It's a highly negative intent. They want to get this bloke out. They don't like him. And they form this accusation. And it is slander. And here we witness a miscarriage of justice right here. The owner calls the steward in. And he takes away his transaction records. In a single action, the evidence that the manager has in order to defend himself is taken away. His income, his livelihood, his reputation, gone. There is no justice. The steward admits to nothing. Actually, he says nothing. And I was reminded of that verse in Isaiah. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. But this is a story. And for the sake of the story, sometimes details remain unsaid. But we see from the passage, almost as if he's in a panic, the steward enters into that internal dialogue and we get a glimpse of what is going on in his thoughts. However, he is quick to think on his feet. Although he has no hope of justice, there is no alternative role that he has to play that he is capable of. He can't beg, he can't dig. So he calls in the master's debtors into the office one by one. And I have to say, I am astounded at how rich this master was. If you hadn't realised, it does depend which version you read. The version we read today was accurate in saying that the amount was between eight and 900 gallons of oil. In a pre-industrial, agricultural um, environment, that is the crop of a whole town or of a whole village. And when this steward releases them from half of that debt, it is massive. It's not just writing off a little bit in the hope that 
someone will see you nicely off in the future. This is life-changing for the people involved. We do see examples of that. There have been times in our own country's history where we have had those times of debt relief to foreign countries. And we see what can happen as a result of debt relief, where communities have the ability to heal themselves, where they don't have the excessive debt burden beyond their own income that they can support. And once again, they can rebuild their own schools, their own communities, their own livelihoods, their own health care. And in a very real way, we hear the echo what it, of what it would have been like for a community to experience Jubilee. A reset button on the economic hardship that was at the heart of God's plan for Israel. And one of the big hints in the story is that actually that original accusation, the spreading of the wealth... was much more a subtle working out of what we see happen here in a more massive and robust scale. And the manager had resolved to do this, not because of some selfish motive, but because this was how he had always dealt with his master's clients. And having dealt with the village in such a way, he would have a welcome not be just because of this amount, but because of the behaviour, the debt relief he had been managing for them over years. There was somewhere that he would have, that he could for himself call home. And although this is a story, I do wonder if this had been based on a real life character. I wonder actually if those in debt looked to those stewards for mercy, for freedom, to bring them a sense of God's grace. And it's important that we notice the parallel in the scripture between the steward being accepted into their houses, whoever they are, we're not quite sure, in verse 4, and verse 9 where Jesus talks about being received into an everlasting home. Because I see an immense act of faith from the steward. He is not guaranteed to be accepted in anybody's home. But he has the faith to believe that if he acts justly, that God will do what God does. And when he needs help, that God will provide. Because this is the promise that Israel has always had from God. That if God's people would trust him, that God's blessing on them would pour out. And it would not, has never been lacking. As Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That is the promise of God. So I see the hint. Jesus is linking the idea that how we are now has kingdom consequences now but it stores up treasure for us with eternal consequences. The steward does not gain personally from this deal. Some commentaries have suggested that the portion he gives away is his cut, his personal um, interest or on the deal. Um, but if that was all that you would then have to live on until death, why would you give any of it away? It doesn't make sense. 
And remember, this is a story. It's not a full historical account. But when the steward is observed to have used the influence he has, remember, he has no money. He gains no money. All he has at his disposal is the influence to make the life of someone else more favourable. And again I hear the echo. A time of liberty to those who are captive by debt. Those who are oppressed. A message of good news to the poor. And I hear Jesus saying, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Luke 4. It is the use of his influence that I believe is commended by Jesus. And I would go as far to say that when, within the actions of this manager, we see a false accusation. We see investment into the health of a community. We see his ability to bring freedom from bondage. I have to say that somewhere within that, if that is not Jesus at work, it's a type of Jesus at work. And that stands absolutely at odds with what the Pharisees would do. In Matthew 28 verse 4, Jesus says, For they, talking of the Pharisees, bind heavy burdens, hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But in Matthew 23, Jesus said that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. So they are the influential governors of Israel. And as I look at these stories, it is the Pharisees who hold all the truth. It is the Pharisees who hold the keys to God's kingdom. They should have been the ones to bring freedom to the poor. They should have been the ones advocating for justice and mercy at the heart of God's love. But they didn't. And to them, the one who did, the one who broke the rules in favour of the poor and the outcast, the one who brought healing and forgiveness, he looked like a thief to be accused of crimes that he had not committed, one who was unfairly judged. So what does this parable demonstrate that perhaps Malcolm's parable of the talents last week didn't? The parable of the talents asks the question, what do I have that I can bring? What can I give? What is my sacrifice? But as I read this passage, I cannot help think that whilst it is a good thing to offer what God gives you on behalf of the kingdom, actually doesn't change me. I'm unchanged by that. I can offer my cash. But what influence has that made on me? The steward who brought five extra talents, he brought wealth. But what did he do with it? For when God gives a blessing, there is an implicit expectation. What are you going to do with what I've placed into your hands? It's not the presence of wealth. And certainly in the world that we live in now, we know that money talks. So what are we saying with our financial blessings? What are we saying with our spiritual blessings? What are we saying with our situational blessings? Because whether we are aware of it or not, we live in a place of extreme privilege. Our influence is off the scale. We are one of the six most wealthy countries in the world. The steward in our passage has nothing but influence available to him. And Jesus ultimately poses the challenge, given what you have, 
given the position that you have been gifted? Will you use what you have to serve God's kingdom or your own? And if you choose God's kingdom, who do you need to become so that what you have, with who God has shaped you into, makes an impact with eternal consequence? Having been shaped by God to think with the kingdom values of God in mind, what is it about where God has placed me that brings the subversive power of God's kingdom into play. And in some ways, I think we need to think bigger about what that means. What I take from this steward was his willingness to take a risk, to act in a way that holds the compassion and love that Jesus exudes, yet knowing that the world will take pot shots at him. I take it that my reputation is something that God may ask me to put at risk. It takes some of that comfortable lifestyle and creates discomfort and worldly insecurity. It challenges our faith to do more, to be more, to go beyond our comfort zones and rely on God. And find that as your faith is expanded and as you see God do more and more, that your own intimacy, your own worship becomes bigger and God becomes ever closer to find that whatever the outcome of the events, God never (coughs) fails us. And that when all is said and done, the only gaze that really matters, when we seek the face of Jesus, we find him looking back at us and welcoming us home. Because I do sense that even in my lifetime, that fabric of truth that has held our society together with some sort of Christian value, it's been eroded beyond usefulness. We can't really call ourselves a Christian country anymore. Our ethics and morality, have, they've gone a very strange way. Yet the ways of the world are conditioning us to receive lies as truth and the ways of the world undermine our awareness of the lies that are being presented within this generation and this is not a new message if you go back to the time of Jesus that early church knew what it meant to be subversive The church that follows Jesus has always held to the truth that is derived only from God. And the world has always been trying to undermine the work of God's mission. So the church has always had a mandate to be subversive, to be a subversive influence, to do stuff differently to the world, to undermine the things and the ways of the world in order to be light in darkness and we are called to be uncomfortable with the ways of the world we are called to continually to be risk takers for the truth and if the world did not spare Jesus then don't be surprised when the world take pot shots at you too and all this came home to me again as I read one of the emails that you get from various Christian um, groups. The one I had was from Christian Concern. But there are so many Christian groups out there fighting for truth. But they are the minesweepers behind the battleship that is the church. 
we shouldn't assume that those groups have the power to take on the battle. We need to take that space. We are the church. And we need to be ready and actively playing our part. Because we know the time is coming, and in many ways already is here, where the world will not accept sound doctrine. So it's an opportune time to examine what our choices reflect about our love for Jesus. And originally I, I was going to talk about some of those environmental and commercial spending habits that we have, but I, the challenge that I was given was to go spiritual. What are the core truths and characteristics that we are being challenged to hold and defend? What truths are we being called to act on and be subversive players in this world? What truths do we need to go back and ask, what has God always called the church to exhibit? Those truths of justice, of mercy, of generosity, of grace, Truths of love and compassion. Truths of gentleness and peace. Truths that look at the horror and chaos of the world and says, there is a better way. There is one who is the way, the truth and the life. And his name is Jesus. This is where I get to skip bits of the sermon. We can certainly make use of our economic influence and how we spend our money, but that's a sermon for another day. But it's the spiritual and situational influence I need to speak into just now. So here as a gathered church, other than gathering for worship? What influence do we have that God has given us that makes an impact on our community? Spring Harvest this year, I was challenged by one of the speakers who described his vision for his church as a church the community could not be without. Such was the relationship and the influence that this church had in their setting. And I say this tongue in cheek, knowing that there is significant grassroots activity and progress being made where we do have influence, particularly with children and families. But what about elsewhere? If the doors on this church closed today, in all honesty, would our communities know? Would this area know? Would they even care? So the question I ask is, what are we willing to risk? What is God preparing us to risk. As families, how about our homes and spaces? How about our friendships and our relationships? What does God need and want us to risk in those places? Or as individuals, what is it that God has placed into my hands? Maybe that something that nobody else can do. What is God calling me to be? Who do I need to be before God in order to use my influence to make my presence valuable to somebody else? Where is God? asking us to take risks for him. Amen.